usual. It's okay. Oh, got it. Okay. And then there's Megan. Okay, great. So let's see. Less than a minute left. So I'll just wait. I just I got a new laptop. Can you hear me? I'm just making sure I've never used You're it good. before on Zoom. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Got your flag tonight, Jim. There we go. Ready, ready. <laughs> You have one job. Prepared. All right, it's six o'clock. I'd like to call this meeting to order um, and begin with the flag salute. Pledge <clears throat> of allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would like to have um, an approval of minutes. So moved. Megan, Becky, second. Um, any corrections, discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Carried. Um, any agenda changes? I don't think so. So um, depending on when people uploaded the agenda, um, there is an addition of a um, an executive session um, after the presentations. So just to note that for the public. All right, so on to awards and recognitions. Um, we have here an acceptance of resignation be resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the board of education for the Trumansburg Central School District hereby accepts the resignation as presented. Motion. So moved. Thank you. Dana, was that a second? Thank you. Discussion. So this is for Marianne Wright, who has been an elementary uh, education teacher um, and has dedicated 26 years of service for the Trumansburg Central School District, and she is retiring. I would um, like to start by, by just, I'm sorry, um, I'll, I'll start. Mrs. Wright is a master teacher, and we had the, the privilege of having her teach both of our children in first grade, and although our daughter's uh, first grade year was cut a little short because of the first year of COVID. Boy, does she handle that with grace, how she does everything. Um, a big, big uh, loss for our district. And 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 um, we I, I certainly wish her the best if we approve this, this retirement request. But Mrs. Wright, what, what a, what a, what an amazing teacher. Thank you. If I could uh, take the opportunity to chime in also, um, Mrs. Wright is such a professional. She is calm under pressure. She, you know, whenever you walk into her classroom, you see her laughing with the children. She's so connected to them and to their families. Um, I just appreciate all the years that she's given to our district and I wish her the very best. She will definitely be missed. I just want to say a quick word because I was lucky enough that both my kids were in her first grade classroom as well. And um, it was just wonderful to have her be part of our family for those two years. And I'm glad that I get to spend this year with her out um, at pickup duty. So I'm get to see her again. And uh, I wish her all the best and thank her for her years of service to our family and to this district. I think it's also, I, I, we might have um, have to make a little addendum here that I'm not sure if Cookie also is granted retirement this this is evening or not. I was I totally going to say Cookie. I cookie. believe Cookie is also retiring. Okay. And thank you, Cookie, for your service. <laughs> I would just throw in a uh, congratulations, good luck. And uh, it was a pleasure working with her and for her occasionally when I was a substitute. Uh, good lady. Thank you. 
Thank you for all the kind words. Um, so um, all those in favor. Any opposed or abstain? Motion carried. Let me just make sure I saw something that said Tina was left. Did she come back in? Is Tina is okay. So looked like maybe not. Maybe she just stepped away momentarily. All right. Well, I just want to make sure that um, these votes are recorded. So let me just write these down real quick. And it is being recorded, Joanna, too. So she's oh, back right. to the so recording. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for that reminder. You're welcome. All right. So um, and on to presentation. So we have quite a few to get through. Um, and we appreciate everybody's time. So first, um, we will have the art department curriculum presentation. So I'd like to welcome, I believe Alan Pennick is here. And Ellen, I'm not sure if you're presenting by yourself this evening or if someone's joining you. No, Sarah's joining me tonight. Excellent. So hopefully she'll put on her video there. Oh, right. I see her name now. <laughs> hi there. Um, so welcome, hi. Sarah and Ellen. <laughs> so thank you for having us come and present tonight. And let's see if I can make this work. Are you looking at the presentation yet? All right, great. Well, thank you very much. So I'm Ellen Pennick. I, I think I know most of you and most of you know me. Um, and Sarah Apker is here as well and she's gonna chime in. Um, and our middle school art teacher new to the district is Kristen Johnson. Um, so we're just gonna start moving right through unless you wanna hit up that scan code and check out the art department on Instagram. And, you know, we'll totally follow you back, okay? We promise. Uh, so we were asked to deliver some data for the classroom, how we collect data in the art room. And let me tell you something, I just went nuts just finding all those great pie charts and I just start thinking colors and it's so much fun. So hence the, hence the slide there. So um, I'm gonna let Sarah, uh, take it away, Sarah. Hi there, I'm here. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. We were hearing you. You're good, we hear you. <laughs> we we're not hearing you now, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah, you're okay. muted. There no, you go. There it goes. My computer is um, glitching up. My, it seems that my video is not working, though. Um, can anybody see my video? Um, I can play it, Sarah. OK, you, uh, OK, So because my video doesn't seem to be working here. Um, so yes, I this past year, I have, or last year, actually, it, it began. I started incorporating more mindfulness breathing in the beginning of art class. Uh, it started when I was teaching remote last year as a way of just um, connecting and incorporating a little bit more movement into our lessons. And it stuck and I'm glad that it did because I really have noticed just like a, a, a more ease with transitions. Sometimes when um, transitioning to specials, depending if students are coming from recess or from lunch, um, it, it there's a little extra excitement and energy, which is great, but but um, starting our art class with just taking a couple breaths together, it really channels their creative energy. And I, I've seen a lot of um, a lot of great things come from it. So I have a video here of me doing it with the class. Um, just to give like a little bit of a heads up, I always offer students choices. So I um, in the beginning of it, because I know not every not everybody feels comfortable doing this in front of the whole class. So in the beginning, I always tell kids that they're welcome to um, to participate with me sitting or standing, or if they just want to um, relax and just do their own breathing on their own, that's fine too. So um, here's the video. Oh, I'm not sure I can get it to play. Oh, hold on. Is everybody able to see this? Yes, I see Video? it. Okay. Oh. 
might have spotty Wi-Fi. And I don't want to use up too much time. We could also just play a clip of it if it's a little glitchy. Sarah actually had, I, I got to sit in on Sarah's class. Um, I was a special guest and I was able to do this with them. And you should have seen the kids. They all were like right into it. They went back when we were still doing remote. They were all into it. They all wanted to be in front of the screen, all participating. It was very cool. And even I got to do it. <laughs> all right. I really Nice. All right. So um, I would highly recommend, you know, starting your board meetings like that. too. <laughs> All right. So is everybody just seeing the um, you're just seeing this, right? OK, very good. And so this right. is just um, a chart of just referrals over the years, and you could see the last three years. I know that um, last year, not being in person impacts it, but this past year, I've really just seen a, a different level of engagement and calm that um, has been really awesome. So I, I definitely am going to keep doing this. I feel like it sets kids in the right, puts them in the right headspace to um, open up and be creative together. And it's just been really all, all in all uh, a positive incorporation. Right. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. Yep. All right. So um, the next slides are from uh, middle school art. And with the middle school art, um, Kristen hasn't been here that long. She's only been here since uh, December. Um, she came right after Rachel left um, and she's been doing a great job. Uh, so she really wanted to talk about middle school data showing um, the use of sketchbooks, grades five through eight, along with potential for future data. So she doesn't have a lot of data yet. Um, she's going to be using e-portfolios and self-score rubrics to show student growth. So that's something that we could look at in the future. Um, she talked about the fact that uh, the middle school has used blank sketchbooks for a, a long time, but her goal is to really start to use uh, more of a sketchbook with more prompts, something that's more interactive to encourage studio mm -hmm. habits, which is something too that we're doing in the high school. Um, so these are some examples of some interactive sketches uh, for the sketchbook. So like you would have some blank pages and then a whole page on color theory, a page on gesture drawing, page on ruler basics. I love that one because when kids come up to the high school and they still can't measure, it's tricky stuff. So this is all stuff that kids can be doing kind of on their own and building those skills. In the high school, as far as data goes, um, I wanted to show kind of how the uh, studio art students are completing sketchbooks per marking period, grades per marking period, and overall grades for um, the school. Some things that I, I like to keep in mind as we're moving forward as I'm talking about this stuff is just the um, studio habits of mind, something that we mentioned in the middle school uh, info, but this um, studio habits of mind, uh, considering the studio art is a mandatory credit in the high school, they have to get one art credit in the high school. Um, with that, uh, we love this, the studio habits. They tie in national standards really well. They align with professional artist habits. And they also, I think, truly overlap with other subjects and help drive habits in other classes. So this is something I try to tie into all my lessons and we will come back to that. So back to the sketchbooks. I've been doing sketchbooks in um, Studio R and in my other art classes now for probably 16 years. And something I wanted to find out about a little bit more was just, you know, sketchbooks are worth 20% of their overall grade. 
And so that means that the other 80% comes from portfolio and projects. That sketchbook grade is interesting though, because it is work that has to be completed outside of class for the most part. So I wanted to see how that affected their overall, like the outcome for passing the class. And what I've noticed is there's usually about less than 10% of kids who just don't do it um, roughly. And when I look at the kids who don't pass the class, it's roughly in that, that zone. Um, and so I think that talks about a greater problem uh, in just work, um, just the work that they do, the amount of work they want to do. So that's truly a motivator for me to get those kids tied in and to better work with them. So the idea of using those more interactive sketchbooks possibly with a little more self-guidance in them would maybe draw those kids in. Another thing that I thought about using this year um, was sketchbook assignments that were really open-ended. So something else that I just wanna point out is halfway through the year, I do a check-in with my students and say, you know, how are things going in studio art? What do you think of the sketchbooks? What do you think of the projects? What could be better? What, what could I change? And surprisingly, nobody says stop singing in the classroom, Mrs. Pennick. It's really unsettling. But I do get some other really good stuff. And I did ask about the weekly sketchbook assignments. And really the kids were like, yeah, we don't mind them. We like them, it's okay. Um, and then there's one person who says, you know, Maybe I'd like it a little more open-ended. Maybe I want more time to free write, which um, it's a drawing, you know, it's mostly drawing based. So uh, I do encourage writing, but in a more aesthetic way. Um, and I did touch back in with those studio habits from that previous slide, the um, coasting, uh, growing, slacking. And what I love to see here is that nobody in my classes, especially on projects, thinks that they're slacking. Like they're all pretty invested, but it, um, I do see kind of that, that move back and forth between coasting and growing. So as I'm looking at this and I'm seeing marking period one, two, three, and four, I'm seeing that as the kids are more engaged in this idea of growing, coasting, I feel like they're stepping up to that challenge. So I find that really interesting too. Aside from that, I just wanted, we just wanted to toot our horn a little bit about some things that have been going on in the art department. That was our data, but this is the fun stuff too. Um, I just wanted to point out that we had a few students um, submit artwork to the Scholastics Art Awards this year. And we only took home gold, drop the mic. We um, got a gold key for Mary Cassidy's Underwater. And Alex Zoner garnered a gold key for her piece called Untitled. This is a 36 inch by 24 inch uh, lino cut, which is unbelievable. It's gorgeous in person. Um, she won a gold key, but then she garnered an additional medal called the American Visions Award, which only goes to like one or two people. I think it actually only goes to one person in the region. Oh, no, I'm sorry, five. And then uh, we, she was also a winner of a national silver medal for this piece. And she has been invited to Carnegie Hall in New York City. So that happens in June, pretty exciting. We also had some seniors participate in the 32nd Annual Legislative Student Art Exhibit. Um, and so we had Faith Flood uh, submit artwork and Alex Giorgiatis. Uh, we've also been doing more collaboration since STEAM has come about. I've been doing collaboration with the um, Spanish teacher. It's really cool. It seems like a lot of more people are interested in bringing artwork into their classrooms. So these students are working on three-dimensional maps, which is really cool. And I'm gonna let Sarah take over this one. So this is uh, this has been super exciting. This past spring break, uh, I was um, given the opportunity to go to the Constance Sotensal Foundation for the Arts, and so this is a uh, an art an artist residency uh, mainly in the summertime, but they they open it up for teachers. 
on February break and spring break. And it's totally free of charge. And they provide you with a personal chef and your own room and your own studio space to just make art the whole time <laughs> or, or do any of any kind of art or any kind of just work for yourself. Cause sometimes people like to go and, and write or um, just work on their own their own creative endeavors. So this was my past spring break. It was amazing and really hard to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Great professional development. <laughs> and um, so this past month also, as we've been finishing up our last art unit, we've been putting on a big display in the hallway for our May open house. We're very excited about. So with this, whenever we have a hallway display, uh, students, they look through their portfolio of artwork that they're about to take home. And then they get to select one piece that they feel really proud of and they we frame it up with paper and they sign their name on the bottom and then we all go into the hallway together and put them on display so I really have been liking having them be a big part of this process and then the tiger was a collaborative project that I did with Miss McDonald our computer teacher in the elementary school and it was great because students had time to work with her on um, gridding and uh, how to how to blow up an image and so they practiced with her on the computer and with and with um, smaller examples. And then with me, we used finger paint to make a really large tiger. So it's on display in our hallway and it looks really amazing. They did a great job. That's awesome. Um, another exciting thing that started last year um, was a coloring book. And this was meant to connect remote students and in-person students. And so what it is, is every student in the elementary school um, create a, creates a drawing and then they submit the drawings to me and we scan them into the computer and, and create a booklet essentially. And they get printed off at BOCES and then every student will receive a copy of this coloring book. And it's just a great way to build community within our, our building and kids are really looking forward to getting their coloring books. They're very excited. Yeah, and they're published. Yes. That's awesome. And then this is just an overview of what's to come with our, our STEAM and art showcase. We're going to have a big art show coming up in a couple of weeks. And um, we've it's been great because of working alongside with STEAM. So with um, this year, it began with our actually our librarian in the elementary school, Ms. Haranen. She, uh, she introduced the, our big idea to students, which is how can you make the world a better place? And then she selected um, countless uh, books that really go along with this theme for the upper grade levels to research and to explore on their own. And for the younger grade levels, read them some stories that related to this theme. So it prepped them for the time they came to art class when we created um, three different sets of projects. So the fourth and third graders are creating our Polaris which are um, a South American textile folk art that is inspired by speaking out against social injustices and, and things that you want to see change. So we're thinking about change and how we can make the world a better place. They're, they're creating this on a smaller scale, but using different textiles and, and uh, we're still in progress right now. So that we'll be completing them this week. Second and first graders, we're, we're working more towards kindness and um, thinking about making the world a better place with simple acts of kindness. And so we came up with the idea of kindness cards and uh, the, the exciting process that you see in the middle here are students marbling paper with chalk. They're floating chalk dust on top of water and that's creating a really interesting surface. And then next week when they come in, we're gonna start to talk about um, how we can write our cards out together. And then kindergarten and pre-K, we are doing flower pots. And this is inspired by the book, The, the, the Breaking News. So uh, uh, all about making like one simple act of kindness. And in that story, uh, the, the flower pot is a very symbolic image where, or an idea where this, where this little girl, she starts to plant these seeds for her neighbors and when, when the community is going through a rough time. So we are, we're taking a spin off of that and it, uh, so these will be part of the art show as well. And then we'll have a station at the art show where students can fill their, their pots up with dirt and plant their own seeds so that they can pass on this idea of spreading kindness. So this is just our elementary showcase quick version. Uh, next week, when we complete these, we're going to follow up with, with our STEAM teacher, um, Justin DiMatteo, where he's going to record student voices and talking about these big ideas and, and um, bringing it all together. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so we just wanted to make sure everybody knows that 
they're invited May 12th. We're having a very large show at the high school. Uh, what we're going to be doing is showcasing art and steam. It's usually our big yam month. We were calling it um, yam, art plus steam equals yam or yam stravaganza or something. We decided to just go with the art and steam showcase. It is funded by the Trumansburg Education Foundation. So we get a lot of our support through them. Um, so that's going to be a show featuring pre-K through 12 art, tech and steam. There's going to be demos, hands-on activities, artwork. At the same time, in conjunction, we're also hosting the senior show. There's one of Alex's prints. That's the senior show art invitation. Um, and then Innovation Nation, which is led by Rachel Caperone and Nikki Firestein. They will also be having their um, display slash show in the library at the same time. So we've got a really big event planned. So put it on your calendars. It's gonna be really awesome. And we hope everybody comes. Thank you so much for letting us share with you. Do you have any questions or comments? Ellen, um, qu quick question. Um, how many seniors this year are gonna be pursuing art or design or that type of creative field after high school? Um, most likely we have, I have so many students who are interested in aspects of art and design within their field, um, but to go full on art, I believe we have two going. I'm, I'm it's a it's a loose number, <laughs> but we do have uh, kids who are headed towards design, um, working with design, working with um, like sustainability and fashion. We've got kids who are working with um, uh, so design within science. Um, we have kids who are just doing artwork just to because they love to do it and that's what keeps them sane. So I'm not sure how many are necessarily at this point going for school, even though some have, they're still kind of deciding at this point, I would say. Okay, very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Really nicely done. And I'm always blown away by these presentations. And also I, I feel like new this year is more than once collaboration was spoken of. So it, it's, and Ellen, perhaps that's why so many of the students are, this is a piece of their career moving full, forward, but they no longer see it as just a single choice for art, which will really make them very marketable. Yeah. So I'm, I'm so impressed by the work that you're all doing. Okay. Nice I'd love fun. to use our, our resources to help um, showcase and highlight the upcoming show on the marquee on the websites and social oh, yeah. media. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll, I'll send you some stuff. Awesome. <laughs> Send it to Lisa Jersick. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. That was fantastic. Thanks. Thank you both. Thank you. The next presentation is Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, COSA presentation with uh, Emily Wemmer. Okay. Welcome, Emily. Yes. Thank you. Are you seeing my presentation? Yes. I'm there. Okay. So once I get going, I won't be able to see anybody. So if you have any questions, please feel free to just jump in and interrupt me. Uh, my name is Emily Wemmer. I'm the coordinator of professional learning at TST BOCES. I just started in this region in July. Starting next year, so in July 1st, I'm going to be the Senior Coordinator for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, which is sort of subsuming professional learning as well as a couple other responsibilities. So what I wanted to do today was give you a little bit of some background on what the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion COSER or Cooperative Service is providing from BOCES perspective, what sorts of things we can be doing with Trumansburg as we're moving forward to plan. I want to give a quick timeline here because if we look back all the way, I chose 1975, but we really could keep going back probably to the Brown versus Board of Education decision. We've been leading up in New York State to this moment. To it's kind of our Copernican moment, right, in education where we're really looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion in all aspects of education. 
Previously, we've had different initiatives or pieces of legislation that have looked at aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now the state is really giving us the mandate to look at it in terms of everything that we're doing in our schools. In April of 2021, the Board of Regents came out with the call to action that says exactly that. They're saying that, look, we've done lots of different individual pieces of legislation trying to address different aspects, but really what we need to do is refocus every asset of our, excuse me, every facet of our work through an equity and inclusion lens, making sure that everything that we do, whether it's library, technology, professional learning, curriculum, is, is aimed at giving all students access to a quality education. More specifically then, by September of 2021, the Board of Regents turned the call to action into really more of a mandate. What they're saying now is that they expect that every school district in New York State will implement strategies, policies, and practices that will permanently remove barriers to student academic achievement. We have decades of educational research identifying what many of those barriers are, what the predictability has been in public education for which students are more likely to succeed versus others. What the state is asking us to do is to really take a look at those fundamental policies and procedures that we've taken for granted in public education, because we've been doing them for generations, that have led to that situation of predictability for some students. The Cooperative Service or COSER for DEI was announced in October, the applications. TST was actually one of the very first BOCES in New York State that was approved for our DEI COSER. We got that in pretty much right away. Literally within about three hours of submitting the application, we got our approval back from New York State. So they're really ready to go and ready for us to get moving on this service. Our direct mandate from the state in this COSER is to fully integrate the tenets of DEI, so looking at those policies, procedures, and systems, and the CRSE framework, or culturally responsive and sustaining education framework, into school district policy and practice. That CRSE framework, culturally responsive and sustaining education, actually came out in 2018 before the pandemic, but then we got a little busy, right, in the years in between there. It didn't really make as big of a splash as I think the state was hoping that it was going to do the first time around. So part of this COSER is to make sure that we're implementing that framework that came out a couple of years ago. What I've got down at the bottom here are the four domains or four um, aspects of that framework. Welcoming and affirming environment, high expectations and rigorous instruction, inclusive curriculum and assessment, and ongoing professional learning. None of those four is anything that's particularly new to education. In fact, they map pretty directly onto the Danielson rubric, if you're using the Danielson rubric for teacher evaluations. It's just looking at those same aspects of quality education from the perspective of are all student groups getting equal, equitable access to educational opportunities and showing proportionate outcomes at the end. Just a quick overview of what our process was. Like I said, we put this in in October, got our, our first application. We did several rounds of thought exchanges, regional workshops, talking to local uh, boards of education and um, different stakeholders were able to join into that thought exchange to find out what exactly we want from the service. We put in the application. It was approved really almost immediately. And our proposed launch date went from July 1st of next year to March 15th. Several districts, including Trumansburg, put in enough money to start up using the DEI COSER this school year. So we have had a few activities, but not necessarily the full work that we can be doing within this COSER. Okay. Again, this is just our little review of the steps that we took. And I mean it, when I say hours, I mean literally. We put it in in the morning and by that afternoon, we got approval from the state. We had several activities that we recommended for the spring of 2022. Most of them really involve looking at planning ahead for the next school year. So this is a document that we had shared with the administrators at different levels within the districts and that we're still returning to when we're doing our curriculum and instruction meetings, as well as our principal council meetings regionally. But we're really recommending that districts take a look at it at this stage is kind of that first stage of the right-hand column, looking at your data. Let's look and see what do you actually have going on right now? What initiatives do you already have in place? What do we really want to be targeting moving forward? 
Looking at next school year, though, we're trying to get a little bit more active and a little bit more focused, too. So for Trumansburg, for the next school year, this is what you guys have access to, regional DEI coordination services. That's me. And I feel like I should just have a little bit of a, a statement about my own positionality in this particular job. I'm a middle-aged, middle-class white woman in a profession full of middle-aged, middle-class white women. My job, in other words, is not to come in and say, this is what the experience of marginalized people are in our school districts, because I don't know it. I can't speak for it. But my job is to really be the coordinator, kind of the matchmaker. Once we figure out what really are those needs, what are those voices that we need to bring to the table, then my job is to go out and find those people, whether they're local community members or speakers on a state or a national level, to make sure that you're getting the support that you need within your school district. That regional coordination service is looking at district level planning. I actually just started this week with sending out some messages to superintendents about getting some meetings together for some district level planning. We're looking at management of some national speakers and consultants. Um, for instance, it was on March 18th, uh, Trumansburg did, excuse me, did participate in Matthew Kay as a speaker, the author of Not Light But Fire, that went through your diversity, equity, and inclusion COSER to pay that bill. We have Natalie McGee from Progression Partners, which is based out in Kansas, who's coming on May 17th to do a session on learning equity walks. So kind of the qualitative piece of the, the data that we're looking at. How do you look at physically, look at your building through an equity lens to see who is represented and who needs to be better represented in the school? Um, Dr. Holly from the, the Center for Culturally Responsive Teaching and Learning, he, uh, his work is also running through our DEI COSER. We're bringing him back again in July to reestablish a share if that's uh, a direction that Trumansburg would like to go again. Okay. We also are able to get you some connections to regional community organizations, both within Trumansburg and looking at the larger community and access to regional or more specific in-district DEI-focused PD for your stakeholders. One thing that is different about this COSER than the professional learning COSER that I have been working under is the fact that I'm able to do things like this meeting. Technically, under professional learning, our remit is only to be working with teachers and administrators in schools, not really to be working with school boards or parents or community members or even students directly. The DEI COSER does open that up, so we're able to reach a larger audience, not just specifically teachers. Okay. In addition to that regional coordination service, you have also purchased in to an itinerant DEI coordinator or officer. We're using those terms kind of interchangeably. That position was posted recently, and we've actually just been in the process of doing some meet and greets with some of the candidates that are sending in their resumes. So we're working to get that person in place definitely by the end of June. Uh, Trumansburg is purchased into that service on a 0.2 FTE basis. So that's looking at probably one, roughly one day a week, actually in district, working on more specific initiatives, programs, services that need to happen in district. I can't speak very, very specifically about what that's going to look like because it's a brand new position in a brand new program. So it's going to have to be adapted very much to what Trumansburg and the other districts that have purchased the officer really want to see happening. My perspective as the regional coordinator is to look at kind of the big picture and see where are we allocating resources. The itinerant coordinator is going to be on a smaller grain size, able to really work directly with the people in your district on a more regular basis. That itinerant service can be looking at support for school level initiative implementation. That could be data collection, reviewing data. They could even help with facilitating some meetings. And like I said, that doesn't just have to be teachers. That could be community members, students, other people within your district. Also can be some on-demand support available for educators and students. A situation comes up, we're not really sure how to deal with it. This would be a good person to talk to to get some perspective from someone who's not a Trumansburg employee necessarily, to maybe a little bit of an outside perspective on how might be the best steps to take with that situation. When we're looking at planning, this is just a rough overview. The research base for diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives suggests that we look at three focus areas when you're moving forward. 
there's no very clear roadmap the way that there is if you're bringing in, let's say, a new reading curriculum. This is very much individualized for what's going on in your community and your school district. But the three main areas of focus are, first, identifying what your focus area is. So that goes back to your data. We want to look at proportionalities. If you have 5%, let's say, of students of Latinx ethnicity in your school, we want to see at least 5% of students of Latinx ethnicity in your AP courses, your IB courses, or your college level courses. There should be no more than that percentage of students getting suspensions, let's say. When you find disproportionalities, that's an area of focus that we want to look back at and say, why? You know, what's going on with this? What supports do we need for this group to make sure that they're succeeding at the expected level of all the other students? We want to get some stakeholder feedback and set some goals, long-term, medium-term, and short-term. We also want to challenge that bias-based thinking, things like deficit thinking, the idea that certain groups of students, whether it's because of their socioeconomic background, their linguistic background, or their ethnicity, are just necessarily going to have a problem going into school. We want to challenge those sorts of ideas and look at things from a more asset-based perspective. Identity erasure, sometimes that's called colorblindness, where we try to, to believe it doesn't matter to me what someone's color is. We want to make sure that we're really examining our own implicit biases and how those affect our students in the school system. And poverty disciplining, the idea that if we just make them work harder, they'll break the cycle of poverty. We want to look at what structural supports can we provide to our students to help them be successful. And then finally, if we've challenged those existing bias-based mindsets, we want to replace them with more equity-based mindsets, some more asset-based thinking, looking at students from a positive perspective, and seeing how their communities can bring things to the school in a more authentic collaboration. Okay. That was quite a lot. Does anyone have any questions? I'm stop sharing so we can see everything. Any questions? I don't have a question, but I would just like to add a comment that I, I think this is a great start and I appreciate that we are doing this as a district and thank you for the information. It looks like you've got mm -hmm. a good program in place. <laughs> so I do have one question just for clarification. You said that um, when the DEI coordinator began Begins that they're able to interact more with a lot more stakeholders. So would that mean that like the school board, for instance, here would be able to have like, you know, a learning session or something like that, just, you know, can something like that be scheduled? Certainly, that's something, and we don't even have to wait until your itinerant coordinator is uh, planned for that. That's something that we can take care of with the existing setup. Um, like I said, with the, the existing COSERS before this one, we weren't really able to work with other groups outside of teachers, but this one does give us a little bit more flexibility. So we would be happy to schedule something for you. And that would be because we do have goals um, in place that um, specifically address this. And then also policy in place as well to kind of at least start looking at those, um, you know, DEI uh, type of things. Um, so I guess it would be really, um, you know, what would be specific to the board and what can we bring to that as well. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation. It was very good. I'm very excited, looking forward to that work. Thank you. We all are at BOCES. It's, it's a real passion project for all of us. So we're excited to be getting this going. Emily, I had I did have a question. There's a, there was definitely a lot to process in that. Yeah. And, and I have a lot of experience. And I, I wasn't able to sort of really, truly get to the nitty gritty of what you might be doing. And I'm wondering if you're going to be able to offer some community conversations, because this is a really important component mm -hmm. uh, or, or um, 
focus on of our community and i think i think it's really nice to break it apart i'm not sure that a board meeting because of the timing and the presentation piece of it offers up a conversation but there's a lot of of jargon there's a lot of language in there that i think just in terms of a um, more time spent on it would you be able to mm -hmm. the community and something Provide yeah, that is, that is certainly something that BOCES can work on also within this COSER. We aren't getting a very clear timeline, this is what you need to do in this order from the state. But one piece of feedback that we are getting from other districts around the state that have been trying to implement some DEI initiatives is they really recommend that before we jump into talking with the community and in just sort of a large open forum, they make sure that at the district level, at the board level, at the administration level, that you're very clear about what your goals are and what DEI means for you as a district, because there are so many politicized terms floating around out there in the community. We wanna make sure that we're all on the same message. So we certainly can help you facilitate something along those lines. I'd recommend that we start first with some of that planning, um, maybe a learning session within your board and your administrators to make sure that you're all using the vocabulary the same way before we open it up to the community. And also, I think, thank you again, Emily, for being here this evening. That was really helpful. Um, I think where the district stands at this point is we have done some of the work. However, we also recognize over the past several years, we've had a lot of retirees. We have a lot of new staff. And so I think where I struggled was how do we move forward each year, recognizing that we have faculty and staff in so many different areas of growth. And so that's really, I'm really excited to have a person on our campus one day a week that can help promote that work with a teacher that is further along and then yet yeah, meet the brand new employee who perhaps hasn't had exposure to some of this work and begin that person on that same journey um, to support the initiatives that are required by the district and also important to um, our community as well. So um, Emily's going to bring it all together for us. <laughs> I also saw, so there was a point to, you said for the itinerant um, coordinator, is that something that can increase over time if, if need shows, if, if we need mm -hmm. that, that easy to sort of up that time on campus? My understanding is that at the moment, the there's still a point for left that hasn't been purchased of that person's time. So at the moment, that point four is being spent in a regional basis. So helping me with the professional learning sessions that are open to all of the districts, as an example. So there is some flexibility within that schedule, if that's something your district wanted to pursue to purchase more of that person's time. Can I ask what, uh, what the other districts are that have purchased? I believe that I know Grattan has uh, some of it. And to be honest, I don't want to speak about the others. I know Groton for a fact. Um, I, I believe it's Newfield, but I'm not 100% positive about that. That's correct, Newfield. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us, Emily. Okay. Thank you, it's nice to meet everyone. Next is Farm to School presentation, and I think that's Gail Brisson. That is me. Oh, great. Great to have you. Well, thank you so much. Um, let's see. All right. Are you there? Did let's you see? Please? Okay. You see my presentation? Okay. There we go. Yeah. Yes, I think so. I Are think we up and running for a little bit, but now we, okay. well, the screen is green. So okay. Yes. There should be a cute kid holding an apple. Yes, we see that. Um, well, thank you so much. Most of you know me as the middle school librarian, but. Uh oh, did she freeze for you guys? Yeah. Okay. Gail, I don't know if you can hear us, but um, you froze and we cannot hear you anymore.
Jenny and I could certainly go next and then we could come back to Gail if that's easier. Yeah, let's let's do that. I'm gonna send a quick message to Gail right now just to let her know. Sorry Thank to put you, you on the spot, Jenny. Thanks, Megan. I'll get EMG. I'm like, oh, Jenny can, Jenny can go now. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Thank you. I'm on this. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, it's so funny. I'm looking out at all the names on my screen, and I think I know every single one of you. So I think that that means I've gotten somewhere in, in this community, right? Gail, can you hear me? I can now. All right, you you froze. Back. Would you prefer to keep going, or would you prefer to, to take a break? And um, How about if you jump in, and then I'll follow you? Okay, so I'm going to go, and then Angie's going to go, and then Gail, you'll be after Angie. Okay. Um, all right, so data seems to be the theme of the, the evening. So I'm going to present on some of our um, SEL data that we have been working through this year. I just got to get my screen up. Oh, and I'm struggling with that. Okay, give me a minute. So the district... Um, you can share it, Jenny. Thank you, Angie. Um, the district has invested in... Um, a social emotional screener this school year called Panorama. Um, and essentially, if you if you look at it like you might look at um, our eye ready or something like that, a screener is um, it just gives us a really good look into the social emotional health and the social emotional needs of our students. Um, so we actually started this process last year and we invested in a program called Saber. Um, but this year we, we didn't love Saber. So this year we did a little bit more research and we decided to, um, go with, um, the screener that we're using this year called Panorama. Go ahead, Angie. Can you see the screen? Yep. Yep. Oh. Okay. Um, and so Panorama allows us to approach SEL, um, as part of a multi-tiered system of support. So it's similar how, to how we approach our RTI needs in the district. Um, we have our tier one students, um, probably about 80 to 90% of our students fall in tier one. This is where we do a lot of our universal classroom-based lessons. So Panorama helps us identify what the needs are at that level. What specifically do our students need in terms of SEL instruction, social emotional learning instruction? And then at tier two, it helps us identify students who need a little bit more targeted SEL instruction, maybe students who are not immediately on our radar. Um, it helps us identify those tier two students. And then our tier three students are typically students that are on our radar. Um, but Panorama is nice because it gives us additional insight and different strategies that we can use to work with those students that might already be on our radar, but um, we haven't quite found our, our, our groove with them quite yet. I'm going to jump in just for a minute, and I've said it before to the board, but I'll say it again. One of the nice things about Panorama is we can choose our own questions, our own topic areas out of their nationally normed um, choices. So if we're a year or two into it, we're saying, okay, we're really seeing some needs in this area in tier one, let's add some more questions for that, or let's really dig into that. We can, um, within the nationally normed, tailor the questions and topics that we want. Um, go ahead to the next slide, Angie. I forgot. I was doing it. <laughs> You're in charge. <laughs> so essentially, we screen all of our students um, two to three times a year to assess. Right now, we're focusing on their social awareness and their emotional regulation skills. Like Angie said, we identified the topics and we have identified the questions we preferred, and we can change that up when we need to. Um, we have two surveys. We have a three through five survey and a six through 12 survey. Um, the questions are similar on both. We also have um, teacher questionnaires for K-2, and um, next year we're going to add the teacher questionnaire piece to our upper elementary school grades as well. And Panorama gives us uh, data at the district, building, grade, and individual level, which is, which is really nice. We can compare ourselves um, nationally, and then we can look at our different buildings and then grade level to see how we're doing. Okay. Uh, so I've presented this slide before, but just some general information about Panorama. Jenny covered some of this. Um, it certainly is a new state requirement that you have a universal screener for social emotional, just like we do for math and reading. Um, but we were working on that to be given away. We're not just doing it because it's a national uh, requirement. Um, we're doing it three times a year. Uh, it's, I will talk about RULER, how we're doing it in conjunction with the curriculum. 
and it doesn't take very long. Uh, one of the complaints with Panna or with Saber was the types of questions that kids were getting, the length it was taking them to do it, the wording in there. We found we've done this in the fall and the winter and have found that it's a really easy survey to give. It only takes a few minutes. It's given in class and students, uh, we got a high percentage of responses. Yep, typically about five to seven minutes at the beginning of a class period, which, which is simple. So when we looked at the data we received from um, the fall and the winter, we were able to very quickly identify our strengths as buildings and um, some of our challenges as buildings. So in the elementary school, um, some of the strengths, 91% of third graders um, reported having positive and supportive relationships, 97% of fourth graders. Um, the K2 report, like I said, that's a teacher survey for students. Um, averaged about 81% favorable in the areas of self-efficacy, social awareness, classroom effort, and emotional regulation. We are really happy to see this. We uh, specifically chose supportive relationships mm -hmm. uh, coming hopefully out of a pandemic, having more students in the building and really seeing um, you know, if students were feeling connected in school, we thought was an important topic. And you'll notice that strength um, throughout, the, throughout the presentation, which was good to hear from our students. It may also be why we're adding a teacher report. 97 seems a little bit high. We did find <laughs> that our third and fourth graders might not have been the 100% accurate reporters of their, their own SEL. So uh, either this spring or next fall, we're going to be adding in a teacher report in conjunction with the student report for third and fourth. Um, in the elementary school, um, it looked like emotional regulation was the area that really needs the most focus, um, probably this year and next year, is 43% of third graders um, reported self-reported favorable responses to emotional regulation, meaning 57% um, reported not so much, um, and with the fourth graders, it was 39% favorable. So that's an area of... Um, of work that we need to work on in the elementary school. And that's questions like, uh, when everyone else around me is seeming upset, I'm able to keep my calm. Mm -hmm. Or when something doesn't go my way, I'm able to continue on with my day, or I'm able to calm myself down. Those are the type of questions that were in there. So it's already in the works planning uh, in Jeannie's building for ways to really um, have this be an emphasis for our classroom discussions. And then the middle school strengths, we saw some similarities. Um, supportive relationships, 79% of our students reported, 79% um, of our students six through eight, like I said, it's two separate surveys. So our fifth graders, even though they're in our building, they're actually on the third, fourth and fifth grade survey. So 79% of our sixth, seventh and eighth grade students reported having supportive relationships. Our fifth graders were at 81%. Um, what was interesting to us when we looked at this data was that it was actually below the national um, percentile. We were in like, I think the um, 19th percentile or something crazy like that. Um, and when we met with our rep from Panorama, he said that one of the things they've noticed coming out of COVID is that students are identifying that they actually do have supportive relationships. Um, so it's um, maybe like a positive side effect of COVID is that they've spent so much time with people and so much time with their families is in that they're noticing that their numbers for supportive relationships have gone up um, nationwide. So it's a relative strength, but we're actually still um, a little behind the national average. Um, and we also um, noticed that our students' percentage of positive or challenging feelings is a strength of ours. So in fifth grade, it was measured as positive feelings. In sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, it was measured as challenging feelings, um, but it fell right within the national norm of, of their peers. So although our students have challenging feelings, of course they do, um, they're not having any more challenging feelings than their peers nationally are. Challenges? emotional regulation. So um, yes, you're having the same amount of challenging feelings as your peers nationally are, but your ability to regulate the emotions that go along with those challenging feelings is a, um, a challenge at the middle school as well. It's definitely an area where further education is needed. Um, and then social awareness. So 55% of our students six through eight fell below the national norm um, in regards to social awareness. 
I presented this data to our um, seventh and eighth graders, and I have to say they are quite self-reflective and they weren't surprised by this data. They're like, yep, that, that sounds like us. So um, they recognize that it's an area of that where we can work on as well. I'll also add that we, uh, the counseling teams and myself presented this data at each of the three buildings at the last faculty meeting to really give teachers their first taste of this data and start talking about the next steps of digging into the kids in their classroom and looking at trends and what should we be doing in the classroom. So we're just getting to that point now. And it was, I think it was validating for our teachers as well. You know, the things that they're seeing every day to have data back that up, I think is validating. Um, in terms of our high school, um, again, similar, similar data to the elementary school and the middle school. 71% um, of students felt that there was a supportive adult in the building that they could, that they could go to, um, they could count on no matter what. 90% of them felt as though they had a good friend who they could be completely themselves around. Compared to our national data, we're in the 60th percentile for our ability to regulate emotionally during times of stress. So that, that number is a little bit more positive than what we saw at the elementary school and the middle school, but it's still an area of, of growth at the high school. Um, and at the winter survey, 74% of, of kids uh, reported they cared quite a bit or a tremendous amount about other people's feelings, um, which is a really great thing to see. 74% is, a, is, a, is the majority of our students at the high school. Challenges at the high school, 26% um, felt reported feeling angry always or frequently or almost always. 24% um, felt lonely frequently or almost always. And um, it looks like 31% felt sad frequently or almost always. Um, it's interesting, in addition to the Likert scale questions that students get, they also have a few opportunities for um, pre-response. And um, they self-reported anxiety, stress, um, challenges with the relationships, and over and over and over again, they reported um, stress and anxiety about schoolwork and homework. And I can say, um, having worked with the high school team closely this year, you know, this, this hit them hard. You know, this really, truly, I think, is an accurate picture of what we're seeing coming out of COVID is um, more kids who are lonely, who are anxious, who are depressed. I mean, it's a, it's a national crisis now, not just here in Shermansburg. So we've been working very hard to um, work on that as a systems level and at the individual student level, but the numbers are, you know, I've been in special education for 17 years are the highest numbers I've seen in ever. Well, and it's also helpful that we have the numbers. You know, a lot of what we've done throughout my career is based on uh, best guess, right? Because feelings and emotions are so anti anti to data and numbers. So it's nice that we actually have these numbers to uh, base our work on now. Uh, I can tell you the high school also reported that there were some students when they dug into the individual level that were a surprise. And so they are their priority list kids that they're seeing next. Yep, absolutely. That's, that's one of the nice things at that tier two is those students don't always show up on your radar. Um, so this can, this gives the, them an outlet to share that they are struggling and for us to reach out to them. You can change the slide, Andy. Thank you. Um, so this, so Panorama, like I said in the beginning, gives us many different types of data. This is an example of um, district level data. So this is what we, we see for the six, six through 12 survey. So it breaks it down into four different categories with questions chose by us. It shows us um, our, our percentage, how our students responded, how we compare nationally, um, and then how it compares to the previous survey. So this is the winter results, and it shows us how we compare to the fall results if we've, um, if we've increased or decreased in that area. And then we see a similar report at the building level. So you can change to the next one, Angie. Um, similar idea but it gives us specifically our grade levels in our building. Um, so you'll, you'll notice some slight changes. For example, um, supportive relationships 612 was about in the 50th percentile. Supportive relationships in the middle school is a little bit lower. So it allows us to compare, compare those two data points. It allows us to see it by grade level. This has been my, my favorite aspect so far. So I can go right in there and I can see that 
55% of sixth grade students are on track with their SEL skills, 79% of seventh grade students, and 57% of eighth grade students. Um, that's a really nice snapshot to see how we're doing now and then maybe compare it in a year to how we're doing a year from now. Okay. And then we can also dig into the individual level. So this is one piece of information it can give me at the individual level. It can show me you know, a, a graph for how an individual student is compared to their fall data, but it can also give me, um, um, it can compare students to each other one, one to one. It can um, group by, by different demographics. So we can really dig into, you know, how's our special education population doing, for example, and, um, and compare it grade level or individually. Now, it gives me all of this data, but what it does not do is give me students individual answers. Um, and that is a nice feature in there to sort of protect their confidentiality. It, it, gives me, um, it gives me the data and it gives me the numbers, but it doesn't tell me specifically how they answered each question. And it does follow the student year to year. So if you were working with a cohort in fifth grade and you wanted to see how their spring of fifth grade compared to their fall of sixth grade, you can do that. Okay, so this is fantastic, right? But what do we do with this information? So buildings right now are in the process of implementing and planning their ruler work for next year. And Angie's gonna talk about ruler in a second. And this gives them um, information for for where they need to focus their attention, uh, building wise and grade level wise. Um, they'll be creating charters and having mood meters and doing their lessons and all of that. Um, but this data gives them areas of focus. Uh, Panorama is also nice because it gives you a playbook. So you, if when you're looking to teach specific skills within your classroom based on this data, it gives you um, activities and social emotional um, items that can be implemented into what you're already doing in your classroom to specifically work on that, that individual skill. And then lastly, um, we have the Castle SEL Three Signature Practices Playbook. There are a lot of um, activities in there, welcoming activities, engaging strategies, et cetera, that help embed some of this, um, this, this work in the classroom as well. So that's, that's the next step for the teachers. They have the data. Um, they do have access to this data. Um, it's sort of on an individual basis now as they're requesting it. Um, but once they really get set up for their classroom and they see the data in their classroom, they can go into those resources and pick items to specifically target these skills within their individual classroom. Um, and then as a district, um, we need to dig into the, um, the data specifically for third through fifth grade. Um, the Likert scale is, um, we think there's some, some challenges with that, right, Angie? <laughs> yeah, so all the questions are a, a one through five Likert scale. And when we met with a panorama coach to dig into our data, a lot, a lot of the times a three was rated negatively, put you into the red. So we can tailor that so that um, that will change a little bit. Um, I can say that I'm meeting with each of the three buildings to talk about how we're going to use this data, similar to how we use uh, math and reading data and review that on a regular basis with teachers and change interventions. Like, you know, we envision this being just like math and reading data as a conversation that we, we have around data. Mm -hmm. um, I already talked about uh, prioritizing students who are not on our radar. And then, like I said, we can tailor the survey areas. Maybe that's it. Okay. Can I just ask a quick question? Go mm -hmm. for it. Um, the, the surveys, if I understand, they're, they're anonymous. So you don't actually know what each student is writing. So Correct. how do you prioritize a student who is not on your radar if you don't know specifically? Who it, it gives me, it essentially rates them, right? It'll, okay. um, it'll give them a score. Okay. And it, it'll break it down into like, these are the areas that they're, they're doing well in, and these aren't the, these are the areas that they're challenged in. Um, and it gives them a score, but it doesn't specifically tell me exactly what they answered. But it, it does tell you who the student is. Yes. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay. So That's I can dive I mean. into um, Johnny's data and I can see exactly how he's doing, but I don't see specifically what he answered on his questions. Okay. I see. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a question about your you guys looking at the um, the three on the Likert scale, and I'm wondering um, if that is in fact scored and nationally normed. 
what your um, justification would be to try and re assign that um, that number perhaps right. and maybe it sounds like maybe polish that a bit um, do you have an example of what where you might have thought that that wasn't really that wasn't an effective answer um, I don't have one at my fingertips so, yeah yeah certainly I would expect that question from a school psychologist and <laughs> being a school psychologist myself um, so I don't have one at my fingertips I could dig in there um, when we met with a data person from panorama I believe that they said that they had different um, norms for that and different ways. Right. Like it wouldn't change our overall ranking. It was just, did they color code it as red, yellow, or green? Um, so it wouldn't change the student's actual score or their rank order. It just um, seemed that some of the scores were, I can't think of an example, Jenny, can you? Like well, some of our students would fall into the red, which is, you know, our, our, our tier three students in, in like say social awareness and when we dug into it they got all threes across the board and that just that didn't align for us that didn't make so sense more a tier us. two is what yeah. you think yeah yeah, we're yeah. Use it for yeah. Tiers. because a three was usually the response was i often feel that way yeah, yeah. right i or i i do, do you sometimes. feel angry i sometimes feel angry that it was sometimes right yes. yeah like mm -hmm. so do i uh, most people sometimes feel angry why why would that put you in the red mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, thank you, everybody. Okay, so Jenny thank and I are you. gonna jump. I just feel like the timing of this is great as we're returning from COVID and recognizing that so many of our students and families are struggling, that the timing is so good to really be able to hone in and focus on the students that are in greater need. So well done. It's been It's been great so far. And Jenny and I are going to tag team and jump right into ruler too. They go hand in hand. Let me see if I can share that screen. Are you able to see that? Mm -hmm. uh, so the board's had an overview of ruler too, um, but you requested to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, ruler is out of Yale University. Uh, we are in year two of RULER, which is um, a framework that we're using for instruction and intervention for social emotional. Um, it certainly has lessons tied with it, but it is more of a classroom culture, I would say, or a framework. Or just a building culture. Yeah, building culture yeah. for looking at things. Um, so year one was last year, and we had our core counseling staff was trained directly uh, by Yale. Uh, we are currently wrapping up year two. We are very proud that um, we not only trained uh, teachers, but we trained monitors, drivers, food service. Uh, we really covered across the board there. Uh, there was a lot of different opportunities for training. Uh, this past summer, we had a voluntary training uh, that teachers could come to, and it was very well attended. Uh, we've been using monthly uh, Mondays after school to work on RULER. We used uh, almost all of one of the November conference days with teachers and those asynchronous days that we put in the calendar was a great way for us to um, catch support staff on those days. Uh, next year we'll be going into year three, which will be our rollout to students and families. Um, teachers will have access to the lessons um, and they'll be done by a combination by uh, teaching staff and by the counseling staff. And uh, one of the things we're gonna work on this summer is how to roll that out to family. So we're not exactly clear on that yet. And Angie, if I can chime in, I can say the response from staff has been overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. Um, giving them a structure and a, um, a jumping off point for teaching these skills that, that need to be taught, it has been overwhelmingly positive. I would say that for all the buildings as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so the training had four main components to it, the charters, mood meters, meta moment, and the problem solving blueprint. Um, so I'll go this, through this fairly quickly. Um, the charters is what we spent most of the November conference day doing. Um, and I just put some examples up here um, on the left. You'll see an example of how buildings uh, and teams created that charter. Uh, you know, brainstorming ideas and color coding. And then I took part of the high school's actual charter just to give you an example of what that would look like in the end. Um, and the charter is really, you know, putting down on paper 
and coming down with an uh, coming together with an understanding of what you expect of each other, what you're going to provide each other, the culture that you want to have in your building. I don't know, Jenny, if there's anything you want to add in there. It's, it's an agreement. You know, this is how we want to feel and this is what we're going to do to make sure we get there. Uh, mood meter is uh, one of the main components of ruler. Um, they say name it to tame it. Um, it is, as you can see the example there, um, it's a language to use or, or a mindset to really be used throughout all of the ruler tenants that you have there. So your pleasantness level is on the bottom and your energy level is on the side. And I have students tell me where they fall within here. Even if they can't name the emotion, they can say, I'm a plus three green, a plus three yellow. You know, that means, okay, so you're happy, you're content. Um, seventh graders really enjoy this. So if you have a seventh grader, ask them about the I've music. seen it in a lot of classrooms throughout yep. the We district. just did it today in seventh yep. grade and they, they rock it. So it's a good way to start recognizing that you're having a feeling, even if you can't name what that feeling is yet. I've also been in a lot of meetings where people are saying, let's use the mood meter to start out. <laughs> Uh, the meta moment, I really like this. Um, it's really um, that framework of what to do in the moment, right? So this is what we hope to be uh, teaching our kids to, you know, to pause, to, to feel what you're feeling, to think about your best self or what you could be doing, and then to act on it. Um, the problem solving blueprint is not what you use in the moment. This is more of that conversation um, afterwards, that deeper dive into what's happening with your feelings, what's driving those feelings, how do you think the other person is feeling and how you can act on that. So it's a lot of preventative work and a lot of um, analyzing what happened um, in the moment. And a lot of this lines up really nicely with restorative practices, which is um, a best practice for school-wide um, social emotional work as well. Um, there are lessons that are available, like pre-made lessons available through Ruler. Um, I don't think we have, correct me if I'm wrong, Jenny, a, a really solid feeling of, are we going to try and get through so many lessons each year? Are we going to have teachers hand, pick, this is what we're going to use next year for, are we going to have teachers handpick lessons that are appropriate based on their data right. from Panorama? Are counseling yeah. staff going to be doing that? Are <laughs> teaching staff going to be doing that? But there certainly are pre-made lessons similar to yeah. those with Panorama that you can be using. And I think that's where we are now. I have been implementing these lessons. So I am in each grade level at least once a month um, throughout the school year. And I have started implementing these lessons. Um, the conversation for next year is there's more lessons than can possibly be done in a one, one time a month you know, meeting. And how are we going to integrate this into what the teachers do every day? And then how much will the counseling office take on as well? Uh, so what's next? Uh, the core team, the counseling team and myself will meet again this summer to plan year three to take a full day to really answer those questions I said. Uh, who's going to be doing the lessons? How frequently? How are we rolling it out to families? Um, we will use a few Mondays. We used uh, one Monday a month all year to work on Ruler. We thought that we needed um, two or three in the fall to really be with staff again, to work as a building, to really prepare to roll it out. Um, we have a plan for new hired staff and teachers. Uh, at least for teachers, we'll be using the second day of teacher orientation this summer to introduce them to Ruler. Um, we've talked about the lessons uh, and then really linking the panorama data and Ruler closely. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I have a couple of questions and this is, I guess I waited until you did your ruler presentation so it might be related to Panorama as well. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so how, um, when you look at the Panorama stuff, how do you compare that with like a student's performance in the classroom? Like, do you compare that 
or are you working to look at those things simultaneously in the future? Yeah, I think, you know, when we're looking at how our students are doing academically, we have to look at multiple data points, right? We have to look at how their, how their attendance is. We have to look at if they have an IEP or a 504. Um, we have to look at their mental health, which is the panoramic piece. So I think it's one piece to a larger puzzle. Um, and that's um, what our student support teams um, do is we take all of these different pieces of data that we have to work on supporting our students who we know are struggling, um, but without the data, you don't necessarily know how or why they're struggling. Um, the data gives us that structure and that framework to figure out where those gaps are and then gives us an idea of what we need to start addressing. I can tell you, um, I said I was meeting with each building to talk about how we'll start to analyze this data on a regular basis. So I've met with the elementary school and we had a really nice conversation about the timing of the data um, and sort of fatigue from data with teachers. So we already do reading and math three times a year and we plan to specifically stagger panorama so it's at a different time so that it can get that um, you know, emphasis that it needs. So that's one thing we'll be doing. Um, I also said before that one thing I heard the high school comment on was um, students that, um, some students that they were surprised. Um, these can be students who are academically quite sound, right? Maybe right. they're quieter in class and they were ones who are coming up higher on panorama. Exactly. So, you know, it is picking up students that other data points aren't picking up. So I know that you mentioned um, that you're able to compare to like national standards. Mm -hmm. Are you also able to look at just within our region or within the state, or it's really just nation just national yeah. at this point? Yep. And, and so do you feel like that's a good comparison or do you think it matters um, the environment that we're actually in or the areas that are surrounding us? Personally, I would put more weight into you know, data over time compared to national. So I would be more concerned if we had a student that came up as a two, right? And then two data, we put an intervention in place and two data points later, they stayed at a two. Mm -hmm. Then I would, if they're at a two and there's typically 20 kids and we have 30 kids, mm -hmm. I, I think that we'd be looking for growth in those areas more than more clout than I'd put into national. Um, they've also did say that the data is a couple years old in, in some areas for the national norms. And we're, we're in a completely different place than we were a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. Everyone's in a completely different place mm -hmm. than a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. How are you um, communicating to parents when you have a student that's in that tier two or tier three place? What's the next step for communicating those needs to parents? Well, oftentimes it's a student that we've already been communicating with parents about, right? Either the parents have reached out to us because they're concerned or we've, we've reached out to them. Um, if it is a student that we're not currently, we don't currently have interventions in place for, um, depending on the situation, it might be a, a parent conference or just a, a meeting with the counselor to, to discuss the, the, what the data is telling us and um, what the intervention is. I have discovered that this is a really great tool to bring to a parent teacher conference. It's almost like the student's voice gets to be in the room with us. Um, and it's been helpful. It's been helpful in those conferences to, to show what the student is reporting. And those conferences will happen separate, would happen separate from an academic. I'm thinking about the high school students in particular mm -hmm. that were surprises and yeah. that came up for interventions. Like, how are we communicating with those right. families that, that think? Well, that, I can't speak specifically to, to what the, the high school is doing, but as a general practice, you know, if you have concerns over a student and it's, you know, Dana, you know this, if it's been, you know, something that is, is hanging on and it's a concern that you have, you would communicate with that with the family. We have great communication coming out of our high school counseling office. Um, I have a, so whenever you place or you, you know, a surprise student that may come up um, as a tier two or <laughs> tier three, the red area, yep, yep. <laughs> um, is there any concern of like stigmatization between their peer groups or even with their teachers? Um, yeah. 
being a problem student? Um, I can only speak to the middle school um, and I'm, I'm biased because I'm the one doing the intervention, right? So I think it's great. Um, I'm in the classroom and we have students coming in and out of the counseling office so regularly and so frequently. I personally don't think that, um, I think we've worked really hard at the middle school to mm -hmm. destigmatize the counseling office. Um, in, in our, we have groups that happen all the time. They're a mixture of um, students who have IEP counseling or 504 group counseling and um, gen ed students. Um, it's an area that in my time at the middle school, we've worked really hard on not, not having that stigma of the counseling office. So I don't think that that's, that's an area to be concerned about, but that's just my perspective. I don't have any data to support that. Thank you. Does anybody else have an additional question? I guess I would just say to end on a positive note, like Jenny said, um, Ruler really went over really, really well with our staff in a time that, you know, teachers are very stressed and overloaded. Um, this was some PD that I think they really embraced. And I can say as a counseling team, we've been excited to dig into this data. And that wasn't the case with our uh, the one that we had piloted the year before. We're finding not only is it giving us the information that we want, it's accurate, it's picking up on the kids that we didn't pick up on. Um, um, the coaches have been really good. It's an easy to use program. Um, you know, we're happy we found that spot where now we can do the work we want to do because we, mm -hmm. we have the tools to do it. And I, it doesn't seem to be a stressor for the students. Like I said, it's maybe five minutes um, and it's simple. Language is simple, all of that. So it doesn't seem to be something that they, they get stressed out or worked up over. And I, and I shared with them, you know, if, if, if your data shows me area of concern, then, then we'll probably talk about it. Um, but you get to decide, you know, you get to be in charge of your story. So if, if it's, if you're not ready to go there with me, that's fine. But we just have to make sure you have adults in your life that, that know when you're struggling. Well, thank you so much, Jenny and uh, Angie for presenting. Thank you. Awesome work, ladies. Okay, Gail, hopefully right. this works. My suggestion, because I deal with this a lot of work at work, is if your bandwidth is not too good, it's better to turn off your camera and then present. Um, and yeah, then uh, well, I'll try that. I moved to a different area of the house that seems to have better internet. Um, so we'll see how this goes. Thank right. you. All right, how does that look? We can see it and we can hear you. Awesome, great. Uh, well, thanks so much for having me in to talk about Farm to School tonight. Um, most of you know me as the middle school librarian, but today I have my Farm to School hat on. Uh, I've been a member of our Farm to School team since we got started in 2019. That was our first year. Um, that year we were lucky enough to be able to go to the Northeast Farm to School Institute in Burlington, Vermont. Um, and at that event, we were able to write an action plan for how we wanted farm to school to look in Teberg. And we came back and made great strides in the 2019, 2020 school year. We were at all of the open houses making food with people. We had tastings with Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, Harvest of the Month folks. We offered professional development. Rose Hansen was connecting with farmers and um, changing up some of the cafeteria options. So we were off to a great start. And then we had a little COVID pause. Uh, but last year we, um, kind of started up again in the spring, just about a year ago, um, on two fronts, really. The first is um, STEAM and PBL, um, two things in our district that are really strong. Um, PBL, of course, has people doing all sorts of things. There was uh, last spring, Melissa Bryant and Janice Beckley collaborated on a hydroponics unit where 
uh, students were growing lettuce in the classroom um, and, you know, really being scientists and taking a look at growing conditions and lighting and um, nutrients and uh, grew a, a lot of lettuce in a very short time. Um, and then in terms of steam, agriculture and food systems are one of the steam pathways. Um, so we've kind of built that in. And I think the biggest success of this past school year was the maple sugaring project uh, where steam students and French students went out behind the school and tapped the trees, collected the sap. Uh, the French students looked at it through the lens of Quebecois culture because maple sugaring is a huge part of that culture. So they documented everything in French um, and students built the, um, the hygroscopic, oh, I'm not sure how to describe it, but the filtering system um, and boiled down sap and made really excellent quality maple syrup. Um, and then this past week at our Innovation Sandbox, which is a monthly paid PD opportunity for staff members to come and work on different ideas, we held a special farm to school edition um, and had a bunch of staff members just fill a board with ideas for curriculum about gardens and composting and soil science and um, uh, a tree survey uh, to document all the trees on campus, uh, all that and more. Um, and we'll follow up with that this summer with some PD. And if you've been on campus, you've probably noticed that the garden behind the elementary school is looking a little spruced up. Suze Thomas has kind of taken that on and that garden is looking pretty fabulous. And Melissa Bryant, continues to work in the hoop house with her students. And we're looking at more spaces where we can um, expand gardening on campus. Um, the other big thing that's happened has been Teberg Harvest, which isn't strictly speaking a school district thing. It's a more of a community partnership, um, kind of drawing on some of the work being done at TC3 with uh, the umbrella organization, Tompkins Harvest. And Teberg Harvest is our local group working on trying to resolve food insecurity in Trumansburg. Um, we just started meeting about a year ago and last summer we were able to pull off a five week free kids farmer's market at the fairgrounds um, using produce donated by the Food Bank of the Southern Tier, um, staffed and run by some of the teenagers in Ethan Crampton's Cornell Cooperative Extension Youth Services Program. Um, and so we were able to hand out free produce for five weeks. We'll continue that this summer. We've partnered with UPL for them to host it on their site. Um, and we have also purchased some CSA shares that will be incorporated into that. Um, Jenny Mayo has volunteered to again run a school supply drive because at one of our sessions last summer, we were able to offer up a whole bunch of school supplies for folks and we'll continue that again this year. Um, the other big thing has been snacks, snacks everywhere. Uh, all three buildings now have snacks that are available to anyone who wants them throughout the day, um, staff and students. Um, we all know hungry kids can't learn, can't focus, um, and it turns out neither can hungry adults. So we encourage everybody to grab a snack whenever they need it, and we've gotten great feedback from adults who said, oh, I was so happy I could run into the staff room and just, you know, grab a granola bar because I had forgotten mine at home and student athletes who say, you know, oh, I need something so I can get through practice. I won't get home till 630 and I'll be really hungry. Um, so we've gotten great feedback, 
with that program. Um, and we're looking at how we can keep that going next year as well. Um, and we've been working with Food Bank of the Southern Tier and Megan Van Ness and Dottie Wright, who are our T-Berg backpack program folks. Um, they get food out to kids for weekends and vacations so that they have um, food that they can use in their homes when they can't rely on the, the school breakfasts and lunches. Uh, so we've been looking at how we can improve that and, um, you know, use of that program has lagged a little bit. So we're trying to look at how we can get more people on board with that. And in terms of what's next for us, we have some really exciting things happening. Uh, we have more school year PD and summer PD with our uh, innovation sandbox and a July session focused on food systems and gardening and cooking and soil science and composting. Um, some of the topics that came out of our discussion the other day. Um, and something that's really big for us is that thanks to the Park Foundation, uh, we have a grant to hire a farm to school coordinator for the next two years to support project-based learning and other opportunities around food systems. So we co-wrote the grant with Newfield and TST BOCES Smith School. So that will bring three farm to school coordinators in uh, who can have kind of a cohort of their own and work with the three schools or the three districts to um, work on school gardens, um, building relationships with local farms for produce for the cafeteria and also for possible internships and learning opportunities for students, helping us to put together a farm to school discovery trail for field trips um, and do all of the things that teachers dream of but haven't really had the time to do some of the background work um, and so I think that'll be a really key support that'll help us to move forward. And then the other piece of this is um, the possibility of a food truck. I've been working with Mike Naylor um, to take a look at having an on-campus food truck. And it turns out that uh, that's a thing. Lots of schools have food trucks run with all sorts of different models. Uh, the Buffalo Public Schools have a food truck that is run by their food service department. Burlington High School in Vermont has a student run food truck. And there are all sorts of different models. So Mike and I have been talking about um, a food truck that would be tied to the high school entrepreneurship class um, so that students could write a business plan, develop their menu, do recipe testing, develop a marketing plan, and then have a chance to run a food truck uh, for a little while. Or a, a club could decide to run a fundraiser using a food truck. Or uh, Rachel Paparone's French students could, you know, make crepes. And, um, and the French or the Spanish students could make empanadas. So there are lots of exciting possibilities there. And Park Foundation has given us some money to hire a consultant to really help us explore the nuts and bolts of how to make that happen. Um, so lots of fun stuff is happening in terms of farm to school. Um, and I've, if you'd like to talk further about it, I'm always happy to talk about farm to school stuff because it's super exciting. Um, but any questions? I know I've kind of thrown a lot of different things at you for um, pretty quickly, but um, it's all really exciting stuff um, that students and staff are just thrilled about. So I'm really excited that we can have all of these great opportunities for our folks. I just want to say, Gail, thank you so much for working with the others, including Rose Hansen, to chase down this opportunity for our school district. The Park Foundation has been and continues to be extremely generous to our school district. 
Um, and I'm just beaming with pride every time I hear about that food truck. You all know that's a passion for me. Um, I can't cook, but the kids and your team and everyone involved will create some fantastic options. And I can't wait for the day that that is splashed with our logo on the side and we're out within the community, perhaps during the summer, uh, bringing some of that great produce and meals to our students and families. Uh, you know, it gives me goosebumps to think about that. And the other thing that I've learned about Trumansburg is food makes us move, right? Everyone is so passionate every time we talk about the food and the possibilities. And we're trying very hard to figure out how we can make that happen as part of our curriculum and um again I, i'm just so proud of how many times this evening have we heard about our content areas being blurred right so all the teachers working together uh, for a particular standard or outcome and that really is the future of education and so we have people like gail and mike and so many others that are involved in our steam program that continue to drive that forward and i'm, I'm i couldn't be more proud Thank you. Gail, I've got a quick question on your maple sugaring. Uh, I'm a part-time maple sugaring farmer myself. Uh, how do you boil it down? What, what heat source do you use? Um, they used a, a propane stove. Okay. Um, they had, um, uh, propane was donated um, and right. then the, the kids kind of fabricated everything else. And um, several teachers sat out in the parking lot till really late. <laughs> now, where did you do it then? Uh, right outside the steam room of the high school, right okay. in the parking lot. Um, I know they would fire it up as soon as they got to campus in the morning and boil all day long. Do you know how many trees they kept? I don't know how many trees they tapped, but they ended up with about three gallons of syrup. That's pretty good. Um, which they sold. I have some of it. It is. That's great. Very, very fine syrup. <laughs> good job. Thank you so much. That was right. such a good presentation. I'm very excited about anything food related. So <laughs> I'm on board with anything you need me to volunteer. <laughs> Excellent. The more the merrier. <laughs> thank you, Gail. All right. Thank you. All right. So now we have our final 2022-2023 budget presentation with John King. All right. Good evening, everyone. So you'll find that um, a lot of what I'll be presenting tonight is familiar. Uh, but there are some changes since the last presentation. So tonight I'm just gonna hit real fast, highlight those changes, uh, and then I will be going through again, the same essential core information. Um, so in an effort to not take too much time on this, certainly if you have questions, please interrupt. Um, I definitely wanna answer questions, but I also know uh, the board has heard most of this already um, with just again, some subtle changes. And then we do have another presentation next week with our board here, our uh, budget hearing. So um, that will again be much of the same information. So um, the big changes, I uh, did some a deep dive into our state aid calculations um, and identified that we are getting less than we had an initially anticipated, um, specifically in our excess cost aid. Um, that area is very much dependent upon our high cost students and what we're getting back on that and does vary based on enrollment and who we have in our district. Um, so that is subject to change. Um, but it was a it was a larger change than I had anticipated. Um, the good news is the net result of what we've been able to do. Kimberly and I spent quite a few hours last week really digging into the budget to to make sure that we could move forward without any cha major changes. Um, so there are no changes to the proposed program. Um, we are seeing a reduction overall in the budget of approximately $775, um, but we were able to, to make those shifts by reducing some of the margins in special education, again, related to the fact that this was excess cost aid that was, was going away. 
Um, we did reallocate some of the grant funds um, directly applied to salaries. And we did increase uh, some of the use of our reserve funds and the allocated fund balance. Um, but nothing that you know, I felt was exorbitant. Uh, it's all you know, basically trying to be respectful of our taxpayers and, and using the funds that we have so that there are no, any other, aren't any big bumps in the road. So again, the, the big change you'll see is the bottom line here. Uh, we are looking at a percent of change for our overall budget increase from this year to next year at 6.4%. Um, so that's less than you saw at the last presentation. So a little bit more of a conservative budget, but overall the total adopted budget that we're looking to put out uh, with your approval tonight uh, is $30,201,002. And two dollars. So, in terms of the breakdown administrative budget, this is very similar to what you saw uh, two weeks ago. Uh, the bottom line here is essentially the same. Most of these things are things that are contractual obligations and things that we had already planned on. Um, so, no major changes here. Uh, the next slide, the program slide, did change. This is where the, the biggest impacts are felt. Uh, and really the two lines where it changed were in instructional regular school and students with disabilities, mainly because we were able to shift uh, salaries to grant funds. Um, we had tr we've been trying to avoid that as much as possible because we wanted to avoid building that dependency on the grant funds, but I felt like this was the most responsible way to, to offset that shift in, in revenue that we found. Um, so the, Again, so you'll see a, a decrease in what were uh, the, in, the proposed increase in instruction. But again, that's because of the buffer of grant funds, not because we're changing the program or reducing program. Same thing, uh, you, we still have a fairly large increase in our uh, budget for students with disabilities. And again, I anticipate that that will have an impact on our excess cost aid a year from now, um, because we are seeing some increases there. And again, there is, some variability built into what we expect with special education. All the rest of these lines in for the majority are almost exactly what they were the last time we presented. So no major, no other changes there. Uh, and the capital budget, a little bit of a reduction there um, based on shifting some of the expenses, but overall still keeping the program intact and maintaining our, our plans for capital moving forward. And that's where we are fortunate to have those capital reserves. So, so in terms of the overall summary, uh, we're still looking at an increase of uh, $1.8 million from uh, this year to next year's proposed budget. Um, any questions so far on what I've shared? So this is again, how it compares, just a brief uh, visual representation. So you can see um, this year to next year's proposed, a uh, little bit of a reduction in terms of capital expenses, slight increase in administration and a slight increase in program overall. So just a little, just about 1% increase at, at the administrative and program level. So shifting, shifting things from capital a little bit. The big changes, uh, these are the positions that we are looking to add for next year that you'll see that had an impact on the budget. Uh, the full-time athletic director, middle school reading teacher, middle school health teacher, and that uh, teacher, the special uh, teacher on a special assignment with technology integration. I will note here, I know there's been some discussion and there was some questions about adding a middle school RTI position. That is in fact in the budget. It's just not going, we don't anticipate that being an add-on position. It's a shift of existing staff. So it won't be an additional position, teaching position uh, in terms of the overall budget, but that position is, is planned for. John, I'll just interrupt you briefly to state, um, we believe that is the case because we're looking at changing numbers in the cohorts. And so within those cohorts, we believe that we will need one fewer section. And so um, we'll be able to create that opportunity without it being an ad. Okay. Thanks, John. Yep. So this is our, the, the state of our reserved funds, or our, excuse me, our fund balance. Um, 
moving into the end of the year. Uh, right now, uh, I've this is where my you know the rest of the the last two months of my job as a business official really is going to be focused on this issue, making sure that we are right where we anticipate being for our fund balance, so that when we get to our June board meeting, I can give you some real solid recommendations in terms of uh, what to do with those those funds uh, in terms of transfers to reserves, so that we keep our bottom line at the end of the year at around that 4% budget uh, fund balance carryover. So again, the 4%, it's a little bit different than the last time I presented because the overall, it's 4% of the overall budget. The overall budget's a little bit less. So that fund balance that we can carry over is uh, 1.2 million. Um, I am estimating that we will be at about 2.6 million at the end of this school year based on unexpended funds um, from our expenditure budget. Um, again, part of that issue, as I've mentioned previously, is, is that we are anticipating about a million dollars in excess revenue, and that's what's really the, probably the biggest pro you know, problem, if you want to call it that, that the district is getting more money in, uh, in its coffers through revenue sources that were not anticipated. Um, but overall, um, I feel like we're in a good spot. Um, those, those increases are things that were, you know, related in some way to COVID, the things that we saw last year, but not to the same extent. So overall, I feel like I'm pretty confident that we will have that 1.4 million to transfer to our, to, to put into our reserves from this year's budget. Additionally, as you'll recall, we did talk about last year, we had uh, overage from last year, um, and that's noted here on this slide of about 3.9 million. Um, some of our fund balance from last year has already been moved to uh, reserves, um, but, uh, at the end of, uh, well, at the very end of this presentation, we're going to talk about the propositions, but this, this last note here of um, the expiring capital reserves, uh, we've moved that, we've put some language into the, the propositions to make sure that that's very clear to our voters, um, that we are anticipating closing out that 2015 and 2017 reserve funds uh, and putting those into a new, the new capital reserve that our voters will hopefully approve uh, with the vote this year. Um, so again, so I anticipate that we will be able to uh, start on the new capital with a very healthy amount of money. Um, and again, what we will do is as we get closer to the end of the year and after the budget vote, um, we'll know really where we stand. And so I would like to plan to present to you some recommendations in June uh, for uh, how to, to make those transfers as a board. That will be your job to decide exactly uh, what we want to transfer into each of our reserve areas. So we will be able to Put a large chunk of money into the the capital, the new capital reserve, hopefully, and then. But we also certainly can look at transferring to to uh, offset some of those other expenses. Like we are using fund funds from our vehicle and equipment reserve this year, so we certainly you know re, refilling that to plan for future bus purchases, for example, is a really thoughtful thing that we should be doing. So so we'll have recommendations in June on that. So now looking at our revenues. So uh, the big change here tonight from the last presentation is that state aid number. Uh, everything else stayed pretty much the same. Um, so um, overall, the total revenue, same as the expenditure budget, will go up 6.4%. Uh, property taxes, just to dig into this, this is exactly the same as what was presented uh, two weeks ago and has been cons pretty consistent since we started. The budget process. Um, so we will be increasing three, it's actually on here, I, I rounded to one decimal, but overall it's exactly 3.07%. That's the tax levy increase. So that's what our voters uh, will be voting to approve. The impact of that increase in the tax levy will equate to um, the 3.07%. Um, from this year to next year, you'll see an increase per thousand dollars of home, assessed home value of about uh, fifty-six dollars. Um, excuse me, I'm not saying that right. The total increase for a hundred thousand dollar home would be a fifty-six dollar increase. Make sure I say that right. So it's nineteen dollars per thousand dollars of assessed value. Am I saying that right? Are you guys, does everyone understand that? Because this is, this is a really important point. I want to make sure that I'm saying it correctly. And um, 
I just don't want to, I don't want to leave anybody, any questions hanging in the air. Does everyone really understand that, that um, the increase from this year to next year is this difference between $18 and $19. It's actually 56 cents per, you know, in terms of per thousand dollars, that's what the actual increase that you will experience as a, as a taxpayer in Trumansburg. So you're paying $56 and 74 cents per thousand dollars of, of assessed value. So the increase is, is small. But, but, but really important that people get that. <laughs> I wanna make sure before I change slides, I'm seeing some nodding heads on, on my panel, but okay. All right. So now these are the propositions and I know that they are also on our board agenda for tonight that you will be voting on these. So just to clarify uh, the, the total budget proposition that we're putting out, uh, the first proposition is for $30,201,002. Uh, that is that is the overall expenditure expenditure budget we need folks to approve. Uh, second proposition is for the purchase of the school bus from our reserve funds, our vehicle and equipment reserve funds. So again, on that one, no impact to our taxpayers. Uh, the vehicle and equipment reserve will also be used to purchase the a new uh, commercial high uh, area lawnmower. Uh, we've been working on quotes on that one for a few months to get make sure we're getting the best possible deal and making sure we're getting the best mower for our, our grant guys. Uh, that one, again, no impact to taxpayers because it's coming out of an ex the existing reserve funds. So that'll be about $79,000. Uh, the next, this is the one I think that's really important for me to just give a little bit more detail on the building capital reserve fund proposition that we are seeking approval from our voters to create a new capital reserve that, that reserve would be capped at $10 million, which would give us a really solid foundation for any future construction. And again, would offset any local impact on any construction projects or work that we would need to do. Um, the, the change that you'll see on this one since the last time is those last two sentences in the proposition, uh, just to clarify that with the establishment of this fund, the remaining balance of the 2015 capital reserve fund in the amount of $100,969, including any additional interest that's accrued, would be transferred into the, the new 2022 Building Capital Reserve Fund. Uh, that dollar amount is basically the balance at the beginning of this year, and all money that's been added to that has been exclusively the interest earnings for the course of this year. Similarly, the 2017 Capital Reserve Fund, with the conclusion of our current capital project, any remaining money from that fund, which currently sits at 236,692, plus interest earned this year uh, would also be transferred to the building capital reserve. So again, that's the voters giving us the specific language to move forward with closing out those old reserves and put, using them to fund a new reserve. So uh, the next- um, I just wanna interrupt again. Yeah, um, please. For the remaining monies that are dedicated toward our wrap up in this final capital project, that number could potentially be less than that as we haven't paid the final expenses for all these last items on our punch list. So um, that's the number as it stands currently, but it could drop. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the, the next proposition, the capital reserve fund proposition, which would be to actually then use some of our reserve funds from that capital reserve in the coming year uh, for the renovation to the IT, the IT building out in that, that's behind the district office there. Um, and if, when you have a chance to look in the budget brochure, um, which I will forward a draft to the, the, to Tina tonight, so she can get it to all the board members tonight, just so you guys can get some eyes on it before it's printed. Um, you'll see in there, uh, the, uh, artistic representation of what that might look like. Um, that is not a final design. It's simply a, a the, the architect's initial uh, rendering of some brainstorming just to kind of put something on paper to give people an idea of what it might look like for uh, for that, that IT building. So that's included in the budget brochure. John, can I, just, can I just ask a question so that I understand? Please. Yep. The capital, the money for the Morton build, new Morton building, whatever, that's immediately coming out of the reserve that we just, that is being approved above that. Is that correct? Correct. That's the plan. Okay. Yeah. So we'll fill that reserve, we'll put the, the funds that we have into that reserve fund, and then we would withdraw once we are ready to go with construction on that, that project and transfer them into a, a construction fund. 
All right, and then the last the last uh, proposition here is for the the library um, in support of their program. So there is a, a slight increase that the this is what we've received from uh, the folks that that uh, manage the library. So a great team there. So that's the the conclusion of my information. Just coming up uh, next, we have our. Uh, the budget newsletter will be going out. I'm, I've got on here the 29th. That is a little bit optimistic. As you know, I'm the obnoxious optimist. Um, I anticipate that it will go to print on Wednesday this week. Um, if we can actually have that out in the mail by the 29th, I would be thrilled, but I anticipate more likely it will actually go out on Monday, um, which is the second. So hopefully that will be out. So voters will have that as a reference piece, but we also have budget hearing on May 2nd. And then the budget vote itself is May 17th. So any questions? Megan, yeah, thank you. You mentioned earlier about covering some of the shortfalls in the instructional thing from grant money. Roughly how many positions are we covering with grant funds because of that shortfall? Three counseling positions. So it's, I, I won't, I, I, I could give specifics, but um, I'm going to say roughly six positions. Okay. And that's just one from this current year's grant funds that we're funding six positions. From the so we have, we're, we're working with, there's actually about six different grants that we're working with this year. Um, and in each of those, some of them are federal grants that we get every single year. Um, some of them are the part of the American Rescue Plan funds that are that those are only for the next two years. Um, and then there's new there's a new one that just we just got a special education ARP grant that Angie and I have been working on for the last few weeks, months. Um, so they're they're rolling. Um, the ones that we have I've been working really hard to avoid using the ARP funds because those are time limited. Um, so we will see those funds through. Uh, in some cases, 2023, in some cases, 2024. Um, but I'm just very cautious about creating a dependence on that because as those funds do go away, um, it, it just means shifting you know, general funds later. Um, so we've tried really hard to keep the salaries out of the grants, uh, but I feel like this is the most responsible thing to do for our taxpayers because that's what I mean, that's what the grant funds are there for, um, but we're not funding positions that we are planning to eliminate. So we have to, to do it strategically. There are several other, you know, I, oh, not several, I can't say that. I, I, don't, wanna, I don't wanna inflate it. There, there are other teaching positions, salary positions that, are, that can be covered through the grant that we're still keeping in the general fund just for that very reason, to, to, create, to prevent that dependence. So we're just trying to be really careful um, but also being respectful of our taxpayers and not, you know, just using tax dollars for, for things when we have grant funds for them. So it's a, it's a balancing act because you know, like the reality is, is that two years from now, those grants will be gone and we will need to absorb those positions into our general fund. I think you'll see, and this is just a, you know, an opinion from a new business official. I think you'll start seeing other districts I know that are not as uh, in as stable a position as we are, more of them will be going over the tax cap, I anticipate, because of the grant funds as they phase out. Because there are districts I know that are creating positions, adding positions with grant funds, and thinking that they're going to eliminate them when the grant runs out. But what we come to find out in, uh, oftentimes is, is that districts become dependent on those positions. Um, because good, good work is happening. So we don't want to be in that situation. We don't want to have to cut positions when those grant funds are. That's really what it boils down to. And I'll just add to that. When John and I were looking at the numbers, we tend to never work in one fiscal. So we looked out three years to say, do we have a three-year plan to support any numbers that he has projected here this evening? And we do. And, and part of that is also because we have pretty healthy reserves. And so we are pulling from the reserves to move that money out of those because again, they shouldn't exceed certain thresholds. And so it's important that that taxpayer money be used to offset some of these expenses. So we're in a very good position where we're able to continuously keep our 
uh, budget rather low and we're not in a position where some districts may be where they need to exceed the tax cap and that's always been important to us because we do recognize that our community is taxed heavily not just our community but uh, throughout the county and so it's it's really important to do our part to not have huge fluctuations within our tax taxes from year to year. All right, well, that's that is my budget presentation. Thank you all. I and you will see a presentation uh, next week at the hearing that will be very very similar to this one. Thanks, John. Yep. Thank thanks, you. everybody. All right. It's not true. All right, so let's see here. Okay, so um, with that, um, as John mentioned, there are some things that we, um, propositions that we need to vote on in order to have them on the ballot. So um, we will start with, here, well, on our thing, it's presentation, it's 6F. Um, so 6F is budget proposition, 2022-2023 budget proposition that the Board of Education for the Trumansburg Central School District in the counties of Tompkins, uh, Schuyler and Seneca, New York, or Seneca, yeah, New York, by and hereby is authorized to expend the sum set forth in the general fund appropriation in the amount of $30,201,000 or $201,002 and to levy the necessary tax, therefore. May I have a motion? So moved. Again, second. Thank you, Randy. Um, any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Abstain? None. Carried. Purchase of school bus proposition that the Board of Education of the Trumansburg Central School District is hereby authorized to expend up to $131,000 from the existing vehicle and equipment reserve fund for acquisition of one full-size conventional school bus. So moved. So moved. Randy. Second. Becky. <laughs> um, any discussions? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Carried. Um, vehicle and equipment reserve fund proposition that the Board of Education for the Trumansburg Central School District in the counties of Tompkins, Schuyler, and Seneca, New York is hereby authorized pursuant to section 3651 of the education law known as the Vehicle and Equipment Reserve Fund to purchase a Grounds, Grounds Master 400 DT4 with universal sunshade and, exp and expend therefore a gross sum of up to 79,000 and that the A4 said total of up to the sum of 79,000 be expended from the vehicle and equipment reserve fund in accordance with education law and local financial finance law. Thank you, Randy. Second. Thank you, Jim. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Carry. Building Capital Reserve Fund proposition that the Board of Education of the Trumansburg Central School District is hereby authorized to establish a capital reserve fund pursuant to section 3651 of the education law to be known as the 2022 Building Capital Reserve Fund with the purpose of such fund being uh, to finance site work construction or reconstruction and equipment of school building and facilities and cost incidental there to the ultimate amount of such fund to be 10 million plus earnings there on the 
probable term of such fund to be 10 years, but such fund shall continue in existence until liquidated in accordance with the education law or until the funds are exhausted and the sources from which the funds shall be obtained for such reserve are amounts from budgetary appropriations from time to time and unappropriated fund balance made available by the Board of Education from time to time and New York State aid received and made available by the Board of Education from time to time, all as permitted by law. With the establishment of this fund, the remaining balance of the 2015 Capital Reserve Fund in the amount of $100,969, including any additional interest accrued will be transferred into this 2022 building capital reserve fund. At the conclusion of the current capital construction project, any remaining monies from the 2017 capital reserve fund up to $236,692, including accrued interest, will be transferred into the 2022 building capital reserve. Motion. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Megan, for a second. Discussion. All those in favor? Opposed? None. Abstain. Carried. Capital Re Reserve Fund proposition that the Board of Education of the Trumansburg Central School District is hereby authorized to expend up to one million one hundred forty nine thousand six hundred sixteen from the twenty twenty two building capital reserve fund for renovation of instructional technology office and storage building, including site drainage improvements. Motion. So thank you, Randy. Thank you, Becky, for the second. Um, all those in favor? Oh, sorry, I forgot to ask any. Discussion. All right, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Carried. Ulysses Philomathic Library proposition, proposition, the Board of Education for, of the Trumansburg Central School District in the counties of Tompkins, Schuyler, and Seneca, New York, is hereby authorized to raise the tax levy by $3,699 from $118,497 to $122,196 for the support of the Ulysses Philomathic Library and such sum shall be paid annually to the trustees of said library. So. Thank you, Randy. Second, Megan, uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Carry. Great. So that was the end of that. Um, I do have a question, and this is um, not knowing what the draft looked like, but I think you mentioned this before. We're getting assistance with the actual, with the printing and of the budget proposal that's supposed to be mailed out with a mailer right yes and so there have they been helpful in like what is required of the of that mailer like what so, absolutely has to be in in those documents that's sent out to voters all the required no. pieces are currently in that document yeah i mean I, that's that stuff is documented i have resources that i get from Questar with what has to be in the, the brochure and everything that so all of the required components are there yes okay I just want to make sure the media, and that was the actually team. sent it to the board by Tina just just moments ago so you yes. you should all have that in your inbox yeah. awesome. got it thank you so much all right so now oh shoot I didn't print the paper out um we will be moving to executive session on a... Written right under there. Uh, oh, is it already on here? Discussion of the employment matters of a particular person or persons. Thank you, Randy. You're welcome. And we will be back 
um, as soon as we are done discussing. So everybody on the board, click out, leave the Zoom meeting to enter the Google Meet, and then we'll return in a little while. All right. Thank you. And for those of us that are still waiting, I, the administrative team has put together some wonderful entertainment. We're going to be singing and dancing. Beginning with Josh. Tom, we'll let you kick it off. Sorry, folks. <laughs> 